-hmm. Okay. Okay. Yes, I can. I can hear you. Ah, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I I don't I don't see your face, so it's hard to check. <laughs> but I, I I remember such a such a case. Yes. Oh yes, finally. Yeah, now now I remember you. It's it's easier if with the face, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, I remember you. Yeah, it's it's much harder with just a voice. <laughs> can start any time. Yeah, of course. Ah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay.
Okay, that's why I wear like this, right? I could put a suit on, but I'm not. <laughs> no, this is good. Yeah, I, I have visited um, Okinawa and uh, Osaka um, and Tokyo, of course, and many um, uh, places in, in Japan. Uh, but for Hokkaido, I think, um, yeah, I, I thought about uh, visiting in 2015 uh, for the uh, World Wide Web Consortium Technical Plenary and Advisory Committee meeting um, at a time. Uh, I, I think it was in the Sapporo Convention Center, uh, but I, I, I did not make it. Uh, one of my uh, friends, um, uh, Bobby Tong, uh, did make it, I think. Uh, and so I think it's not me coming to uh, Sapporo, it's Sapporo coming to me uh, every time uh, that we have a hackathon with pizza. Uh, it's often with beer. Uh, and of course, on, on the beer, uh, you see uh, Sapporo, <laughs> but, but I, I don't, uh, I haven't uh, personally been um, to uh, the visit, but I really look forward to after the COVID. Yes, that, that would be um, an excellent thing to do, actually, after COVID. I, I really look forward to visit and stay for uh, a few more days uh, because previously, uh, before joining the cabinet, uh, I was touring around Europe uh, to many different places, many different hackathons. But for each place, I used to stay only a day or two. Uh, and so it's much more like just changing the uh, you know uh, wallpapers, <laughs> uh, the, the backgrounds of the desktop. Uh, but then uh, after being the a minister, I learned that in order to really uh, get into a mood uh, of understanding where people's uh, ideas are coming from, you really have to spend a week or at least um, with, with other people. So I look forward to more longer stays.
Yeah, certainly. Uh, I'm recently interested in uh, a, a startup called XR Space uh, for Extended Reality. Uh, it's the first virtual reality headset uh, with no controller. I can just control it with my hands, and it's very light with its own 5G connection, uh, so I can wear it for like three hours or four hours without fearing uh, of fatigue or things like that. Uh, and so uh, I will um, make together uh, with some artists a kind of synthetic version of me uh, in that XR space, so people can ask me questions, and uh, Audrey in that space will synthesize poetry based on the transcripts that I had put on GitHub, uh, and so it becomes a kind of interactive um, dialogue uh, art installation, uh, but entirely in the extended reality. I really like how 5G uh, can bring people closer and feel like a sense of co-presence uh, in the same room, as opposed to Skype, where we're very uh, clearly seen we're in different rooms.
Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, I have interacted indeed uh, with people from like middle school and senior high school um, all the way uh, to the um, you know central government and so on in my conferences and there is uh, I think one thing uh, that really connects Japan and the Taiwan view of technology is the idea that society need to lead the direction of technologies that technologies are not just curiosities uh, but um, as um, we often say it must be become an infrastructure for the society, that is to say, to serve a societal purpose. And that's why I think uh, while Industry 4.0, uh, people know about the idea, uh, Japan has the idea of Society 5.0, meaning that society is one version newer than the industry, and the industry uh, needs to upgrade uh, to work with the society, not the other way around. Um, and so many people ask questions about instead of disruptive technologies, can we work on inclusive technologies, and I, I think that's something that Taiwan and Japan has a lot of common.
Yeah, uh, it's interesting because when I was asked to become the digital minister in 2016, uh, we talked a lot uh, within the GovZero movement, and there's at least like five other people who I think are equally qualified. Uh, and of course, you know some of these people if you have come to GovZero Summit. Uh, there's Jia Liang Gao, um, there's also uh, Professor Chen Shengwei, who have been uh, with us since the beginning of GovZero, uh, who actually went to the interview with the premier, with me, uh, and so on. So there's no shortage of um, like digital minister caliber people in the GovZero movement. And uh, I'm, I think, only because I'm already retired. I'm only <laughs> uh, uh, 33, 34 uh, when I joined the Sunflower movement um, and uh, work on it full time. Uh, so people see me more. Uh, I become sort of like a public face. Uh, but actually, there's many people working together. Uh, and um, um, it's interesting because uh, in Kofa Japan, there's a lot of chapter leaders and regional leaders uh, that could, I think, in my mind, serve equally well as the digital minister. Um, and uh, that's, I think, why in Taiwan we have this system called reverse mentorship, uh, where each minister in the cabinet can uh, work with two people, uh, usually under 35, uh, as mentors uh, to that minister. And so I worked in this office for a couple years with uh, Minister Jacqueline Tsai. And at the time, also another GovZero collaborator, um, Tony Q, also worked in the same capacity. And so just build a intergenerational solidarity between the cabinet member who are older on one side and the younger people uh, on the other side who already have a digital native connection um, in the Taiwan case, it's Gov Zero, but in your case, it's Co for Japan. I think it, it could make changes happen. It doesn't have to be me, uh, but anyone who serves in that position need to have a very strong connection with the civic technologist community.
Yeah, it is easier uh, if you are in a place that's clearly marked as the Youth Advisory Council. Uh, that is to say, uh, the Confucianism um, extends to the respect for the institution. So without institution, of course, seniority is the norm. But if you design an institution that very easily let people see, oh, this is the essentially the young people's council and the elderly are here to provide resource and support to the new direction that the young people, the reverse mentors, uh, are creating, then uh, people yield more to the institution than to the seniority. So having a clearly spelled out institution is very important. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, on the national level, there is the presidential hackathon uh, in which the president gives five trophies every year to five teams. And this year, the five teams, the five data collaboratives, um, only one uh, is from the central government. <laughs> Everything else is from the social sector and from the local um, groups. Uh, this is great because it elevates uh, the status of the regional social innovators. They can 
uh, start with only working in a very small area. Uh, and um, there is uh, actually a social innovation from Japan. Uh, I think it's called uh, My Mitsu. Uh, that um, makes people um, refill their bottles instead of buying new plastic bottles. Um, and the Maimitsu team uh, did a map so people can see uh, where are the refill stations uh, around them. Uh, and so a Taiwan uh, team uh, did something very similar uh, called feng cha or serving tea. Uh, but the difference uh, is that they connect them not only to the water refill stations, but also to the uh, regional placemaking shops, um, as well as uh, the drink shops uh, that actually provides the social entrepreneurs products uh, to, for example, example, those out of spec uh, agricultural products and make it into jam and, uh, and then make the jam into drinks uh, and things like that. So people understand the social purpose of those place making uh, shops uh, in addition to getting their bottles refilled and their habits changed. Um, and so almost immediately after receiving the presidential hackathon uh, trophy, which is a micro projector, if you turn it on, the projector, uh, President Tsai, promising you whatever you did in the past three months will become public policy in the next 12 months. So um, the um, people installed the app increased tenfold uh, and many, many more people start to think in different ways when it comes to using uh, water bottles uh, and habit changing. And this is a small example, but it shows that just having a uh, executive branch power as a commitment pre-commitment to a hackathon can really change the follow-up because without this commitment, uh, maybe the Environmental Protection Administration will not uh, follow up to such a high degree. But because everybody knows that the president has promised publicly to make it happen in the next year uh, in a nationwide uh, rollout, everybody uh, in each precinct and district uh, feels strongly about joining this network.
Yeah, um, there is a strong uh, interest, especially in places where it's harder to get the humans uh, staff uh, required for like spraying pesticide and so on um, to switch those work to uh, drones. Uh, and I understand that in the Japan Agriculture Cooperative, uh, Makubetsu and the Hokkaido um, Obihiro Agriculture High School uh, and also the Technical High School uh, have also worked on education classes that involves the drones uh, to spray pesticides and with a very large like 16 liter tank uh, and in Taiwan we made sure that when we deploy 5g technology which will bring such uh, drones into everyday use not just experimental use we start in the places where um, the like the fisheries are and where the farmers are uh, in the more uh, rural places because um, in the larger municipalities uh, we already have a um, backbone of high fiber optics and Wi-Fi, and the Wi-Fi is very dense, uh, so the case for 5G is less pronounced. Uh, but in those more rural places, um, because it's harder to get fiber optics everywhere you farm, right? 5G uh, makes a lot more sense. Uh, and so when designing our auctioning for 5G spectrum, we make sure the five telecom have to pay a lot of extra money, which then we reinvest starting this year uh, back to the more rural places uh, to reward the local cooperatives and social entrepreneurs to work with the telecoms on what we call uh, the sandbox for 5G deployment. And these include, of course, self-driving vehicles, but also telehealth and teleeducation as well.
Yeah, just um, in um, late uh, September, uh, in 19th of September, I had a call uh, with the JCI Japan, uh, the Okinawa IT Forum uh, for the Junior Chamber International, uh, I think, uh, and there's uh, a lot of ideas being brainstormed uh, around this kind of uh, collaboration. Uh, we talked about how when I last visited Nokia Nawa, uh, there was a typhoon, uh, and so uh, for a day uh, I was essentially quarantined uh, in the hotel, uh, but uh, I could still um, see the the very beautiful ocean, and there's a really good internet connectivity. So we brainstormed that even if uh, we had to uh, endure 14 days of quarantine when flying to Okinawa, how to make uh, this 14 days relevant as a tourism um, kind of experience working with the quarantine hotels. That's something the Taiwanese hotels do, uh, and they offer a kind of authentic experience of night market and so on. <laughs> even though you're high uh, in a quarantine hotel, uh, they can still um, offer you an experience like you're a, a, a tourist. Uh, and so there's a lot of things that uh, broadband and technologies can help uh, to make um, tourism still relevant. And the after COVID, after we get the vaccines, um, like people to people relationships stronger uh, instead of uh, making it like more distance and remote uh, during the COVID um, days. So I still remember fondly of the JCI Japan Okinawa conversation. Yes, uh, and also it's very practical because uh, the sandbox uh, regulations in Taiwan 
also mandates that there must be a societal problem to solve, a societal challenge to be met uh, when bringing those sandbox cases. And as I mentioned, 5G in municipal areas are good to have, uh, but in the rural areas, they have many use cases that are must have. Uh, and so in those must have scenarios, there's easier uh, argument for the investors to bring their resources uh, to better the place instead of uh, just being one of the many choices uh, alongside fiber optics and other connectivity methods. Uh, and so it's both out of a kind of um, equality-based uh, worldview when it comes to especially health, education, and communication, but it's also based on a very practical view of a higher social return of investment uh, in the longer run is also a better return of investment. Yeah, uh, I think uh, it's not necessarily a very high return of investment, but it could be a lot of uh, inclusion um, ideas that came to foster the innovation for the company itself, especially if it's a small or medium enterprise. Most of the innovation happens in the ecosystem outside of the R&D department of that small and medium enterprise anyway. And so this is uh, the core argument of the open source movement by having access and contributing to an open innovation ecosystem, you don't earn money, but you reduce cost. Uh, you essentially crowdsource your R&D and to reduce the cost on um, betting on the infrastructure investments that could be very costly and very high risk. For example, experimenting with distributed ledger technology. Um, you can try 10 different DLTs uh, and they don't work as well <laughs> as the uh, original solutions, but maybe you end up with the one DLT that works for a very specific use case and that actually provides business value. But if you have to do all the R&D yourself, then uh, any SME, even even the medium size or even larger enterprises cannot afford to run so many experiments in the same time. But by teaming up with open innovation communities, such as the Ethereum community or the Hyperledger community and so on, essentially you only 
benefits um, from the cases where it makes business sense to you, but you also empower your own uh, staff uh, to understand the latest and the greatest in open innovation so that when they see a new challenge coming, they will not say, oh, these are not invented here. They will say, oh, I know this maintainer and I will just give them a pull request or give them a call and then we'll work on this emerging technology altogether. So the case is not an immediate ROI case. This is not an investment case. This is a business development and an HR case.
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Trend Micro is a really good example uh, because they have a few uh, staff members that just voluntarily, in their spare time, work with uh, the GovZero project called Cofacts uh, that crowdsourced the end-to-end -end encrypted channel. It's called Line. It's also used in Japan. It's actually uh, also a social contribution uh, because of the earthquake, right? So on the Line system, uh, there's many people uh, sharing uh, misinformation and that's where most of those disinformation uh, came from. Uh, they basically uh, look at what misinformation gets trending and start designing intentional disruptive campaigns out of it. So um, the Trend Micro, uh, after taking a look at the Cofacts project where people can crowdsource the fact checking around the trending reported spam uh, and other uh, misinformation on social media, uh, they uh, roll out their own version of Dr. Message, uh, which has a mascot. It's a very cute dog, uh, maybe not as cute as Hatsune Miku, uh, but still very cute. <laughs> and so um, people just share it and uh, invited the Dr. Message uh, dog bot uh, to their chat room. So anytime they share a, a misinformation, uh, the dog will actually um, s sniff it <laughs> uh, and then respond with clarification, sometimes very funny clarifications um, immediately. And so that uh, makes the disinformation campaign uh, much harder to spread when people are vaccinated uh, with a cute dog. Uh, it's called a uh, humor over rumor. Um, and so even for small and medium enterprises owners, such open uh, civic um, tech communities are still there, right? So you can have, uh, for example, when I worked uh, with the social text um, company, they have their own uh, open, like, um, I think uh, it's modeled after the food camp, uh, but they call it the bar camp. Um, so because uh, bar after food, right? So the, the bar camp is a, a kind of friendly hackathon uh, where people are invited to use the social text uh, campus for open innovation. And also we have what we call a wiki Wednesday uh, where we can take like 20% time off and work on such social innovation projects. And on the Wednesday, there's a demo uh, to show the company what social innovations we have produced with the community. And I think it's exactly because of that system, uh, Trend Micro promoted the doctor message from being a side project into being a institutionalized section uh, within their company. So that's what I mean by open innovation.
No, we.
Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I think it's a interesting uh, topic to talk about inclusion. Um, when you come from an indigenous uh, viewpoint, the ideas uh, are very different um, from a um, like civic participation because the exclusion was not because of your age, like you're too young to vote. People understand, okay, one day I'll be old enough to vote. Uh, and it's not about uh, disenfranchising, like because you're a woman, you're not allowed to vote. Uh, well, now we know now <laughs> that uh, with uh, the suffragettes uh, working and also intersectionality uh, in mind, uh, the voting is the basic uh, power uh, that the women can express themselves and so on. So these are uh, like natural progressions. Uh, and although different jurisdictions in Asia have different time scales, we more or less agree that we should be more inclusive when it comes to public participation. But that's because each one of us have been a teenager, uh, and uh, half of us uh, went through the female puberty, uh, me included. Uh, and so there's a, a large amount of people. But uh, for, for Ainu, uh, or from the Moedic uh, viewpoint, the Amis and other indigenous uh, languages, it's not like that, right? If it goes to a referendum, um, people who have even heard of their cases is strictly in the minority. So the usual direct participation of referendum or representatives uh, in a parliament and so on are not guaranteed that with time it will get better. In fact, it may get worse because less and less people remember the culture. And uh, there's also the worry of appropriation, like um, if people uh, see this as mostly a tourism thing uh, or as a kind of cultural diplomacy thing, uh, then it actually deprives the indigenous people of their own agency, of their own uh, willingness to, to act. And so. I I think this is a complex topic that cannot be tackled in five minutes, uh, but I will just very quickly say that it makes sense to start from that point of view, from an indigenous point of view, and code not for Ainu, uh, but with um, Ainu. Uh, and the code for um, mentality works differently and must adjust when you're working with indigenous um, people. It's not for them, it's with them, and even after them, that's the right attitude.
Yeah, sometimes it's a matter of language. Uh, in Taiwan, we call programming software design. So I'm a software designer. Uh, we don't say that we're software engineers. Uh, and uh, it's uh, just a simple word change. And admittedly, in programming, there's the part of us that talk to other people, which is more like design. And there's the part of our word that talks to computers, which is more than uh, uh, just writing code. It's also engineering the architecture. But by emphasizing that it's about program design, that's to say working with people, not only we have gender balance uh, in the people who choose software design as their career, but it also enables us to talk to other designers like inter interaction designers, uh, service designers, uh, and so on, and which are all very important to the practice of designing software. And with the AI-assisted uh, uh, intelligence programming, I think the code generation part, the actual writing code part, is more and more automated. Nowadays, GPT-3, you can just tell it uh, the specification, the user story, and say, here are the React code to make this. And then GPT-3 will actually just write some React code for you. So it's very um, apparent to me that the people-to-people -people skills, um, the autonomy uh, to find and define um, these issues by yourself, and also listening to others to interact, and then finally to find those common values out of different positions. These are a designer and a facilitator skill. And if we see software programmers as more designers than engineers, then I think that would enable and prepare us uh, for such a future.
Yeah, um, I think um, just like we are not expecting all the children to become coders, but it's important to understand computational thinking, right? The abstractions um, that we use to simplify a very difficult situation or a difficult challenge into manageable uh, ideas. So is design thinking important, even if not all children end up becoming designers. And design thinking, uh, which is a ideal um, idea, is basically saying uh, if people have variously different um, positions, we can always discover their feelings and then define a common feeling, a common value upon which we can then innovate and develop and then deliver something of value to the people. And so this double diamond shape, of course, it can go on and on. If you are a open innovation, the delivery is just the beginning of another iteration. Uh, but the idea that people have common values, and here is a set of thinking um, mechanism that people can arrive to common value despite their differences. This is very important, even if you're not a professional designer. Um, so I think computational thinking uh, and design thinking, these are just like universal vocabulary that we can use more in our day-to-day -day, uh, social innovation and that will empower people even with zero coding uh, experiences uh, to contribute more of their time in a way that basically lifts up everybody's perspective because with each contributor you see a new pers perspective on the project that we're working on together it's much more inclusive this way
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, when I first uh, participated uh, in internet governance projects, uh, I have my email address. That's what people understand uh, that they can communicate with me. Most people I communicate with has no idea I'm just 15 years old or 16 years old. So the internet doesn't know your, your age, right? Uh, and so even if I'm a teenager right now, I think I can still work well um, as a minister in the cabinet and also uh, maybe as a member of the Open Government Partnership um, National Action Plan Council, which just formed. Uh, and this is not a hypothetical answer because we do have a teenager <laughs> in our Open Government Partnership uh, Council. Um, And she uh, was um, um, brought into the council because she uh, initiated a very famous initiative um, about three years ago um, when she was just 16 years old uh, and asking for the gradual uh, banning of the plastic straw for bubble tea um, in Taiwan uh, because it causes a lot of damage uh, to the sea, right, to the ocean and also the carbon footprint. And it was uh, very successful. Um, and so basically, uh, we don't know uh, when the petition came, uh, whether this pseudonym, uh, I think her pseudonym was, I love elephants and elephants love me. So I don't know the age of this initiative's uh, proposal. And But they very successfully mobilized more than 5,000 people. And we brainstormed the ways uh, that the single-use utensil makers can make the uh, straws in a way that are maybe from organic straws, maybe from plastic, maybe redesigned so you don't have to have used a straw and so on, um, in a way that is truly co-creative. And uh, her contribution was uh, a lot um, to say to the popularity of the platform, uh, the joint platform. And so um, now she, of course, is our national action uh, plan board uh, council member, um, but she's still a teenager. Uh, 19 years old uh, at the moment. Uh, the, her name is Wang Xuanru. Uh, and so I use this example by saying um, I don't really see necessarily a difference between teenagers and adults and elderly people when it comes to social innovation. Each of us have something to contribute. Uh, and as I mentioned, um, often I quote Leonard Cohen that there is a crack in everything and that's how the light gets in. Um, people who have less preconceptions see the crack uh, not as part of the building, but as something that the light can get in. And of course, a fresh perspective always works well, but you don't have to be a teenager to have a fresh perspective. Just step outside of your comfort zone and then work with people who you don't know well, and then very quickly, they will see the crack in you and you will see the crack in them. And together, the light will come in. And that's my message.
No, I actually have to go. Uh, I have another meeting on the APR IGF, uh, like in 13 sec uh, minutes. ありがとうございました。